Um, thank you very, very much for that. And uh, I'm glad that Jennifer uh, mentioned my first encounter with the ancient world in the British Museum. But I'm going to start a little bit later uh, and say, uh, not much later, uh, and say that I first went to Rome uh, over 40 years ago in 1973. And I vividly remember then that one of the things that struck me most forcibly were actually not the ancient ruins, not the wonders of Renaissance art, but the fact that still stamped onto every manhole cover and onto every lamppost and published trash can were the letters that 2,000 years earlier had stood as an abbreviation for the ancient Roman state itself. S-P-Q-R, Senatus Populusque Romanus, the Senate and Roman people. Even now, it's the symbol and the logo of the modern city of Rome. I think it probably is the longest lasting acronym in the history of the world. And I would never have believed in 1973 that I would wind up, just a little bit over 40 years later, having written a quite long history of ancient Rome with exactly that title. Uh, and I'm uh, very, very pleased to be here tonight, which is actually the official publication day of this book in the United States to answer what I think must be the most obvious question that any new history about Rome raises. Which is, to put it bluntly, why on earth do we need another history of ancient Rome? You know, aren't there quite enough of them already? And I hope this evening that I can show you that and why we do need to go back to Rome. We do need to go on rewriting it. And to give you a little taste, but it'll only be a very little taste, of what my particular version of that is like. Now, the first reason for needing a new history is extremely simple. That is, new things about the Roman world are being discovered all the time. And ancient Rome is changing in quite unexpected ways, in ways that a historian writing even 50 years ago, let alone Gibbon writing his decline and fall in the 18th century, could never have imagined. And that's often through the appliance of modern science. Now, one of my favourite examples of this is the material that is even now coming up from the Greenland ice cap, where in deep borings, scientists are bringing up cores of ice which still contain the analyzable traces of the pollution left by Roman industrial processes uh, at a level not matched until almost 2,000 years later. Now, I'm afraid I can't actually show you one of these cores themselves, and I suspect you might already have guessed that, it, that the whole uh, analysing process is a bit more complicated than just bringing up the ice and looking for little black bits in it. Um, but here is a fridge <laughs> in Utrecht in which some of these cores are kept. And I did go and have a look at them recently, and the scientists working on these are extremely interesting um, because they're trying to say, where did this pollution come from? And the likely answer is that it came from the silver mines that the Romans worked in Spain, one of the biggest industrial processes in the whole of the Roman world, uh, actually producing the, the metal which in the end produced the coinage of the Roman world, was probably what was one of the first examples of global industrial pollution that we have. 
Now, as I say, I'm afraid I can't show you the cause, and, <laughs> and it's, they're not quite as clear to the naked eye as you might hope. But I can show you um, one of the skulls from Roman Britain, which is the subject of some equally cutting-edge science, which is actually enabling us to track the migration and movement of people in the Roman Empire. Now, we've had only very tantalising glimpse, glimpses before of that kind of movement, and it's often from, almost always in fact, from tombstones. Now, this on the screen now is one of the most intriguing of the glimpses of migration uh, that we've been able to look at until recently. It comes from the north of Britain, and at first sight it isn't anything particularly special. Um, it's the memorial to uh, a woman, and to put her slightly bigger, she's sitting here uh, with her treasure chest at her feet, and her wool working uh, on her lap. But underneath the figure of the dead woman, um, there's an inscription which tells a slightly more unexpected story. It explains that she was a woman called Regina, and that really means queenie, I suppose. And she came from the south of the country. She was from the Catavalonian tribe, uh, and she had actually been a slave. She was an ex-slave, a liberta. And she had been later freed and married a man called Baratis, who says, and this is a rather you know, nastily, I'm afraid, or slightly sadly topical place to come from, Baratis came from Palmyra. He was a Palmyrinos. Uh, and here he commemorates his ex-slave British wife, both in this perfectly passable Latin here, but also underneath in his native Aramaic. Now, uh, this is, I, I think, a very evocative tombstone, and it raises enormous numbers of questions about how the Roman Empire worked. Like, what on earth was uh, Mr. Baratis here? What on earth was he doing thousands of miles away from Palmyra in the north of Britain on Hadrian's Wall? And how had he hitched up with Regina, <laughs> Queenie? Um, you know, had he once been her owner, had he bought her as a slave? That's my guess, but we don't know. Um, but you can go on asking questions like, you know, what on earth did they speak at home? You know? <laughs> had Regina learned Aramaic? Or did they speak Latin? Or did they speak some native English language? And you know, even more than that, I suppose, that you kind of think, did these people look odd in the north of England at the time? Did they say, oh, that, that, that funny couple with the Palmyrene husband? <laughs> or was this absolutely normal? Now, they are actually just one rather vivid example, uh, and an isolated example, of the mobility of people within the Roman Empire that we are now starting to be able to track on a much bigger level, and that is by going back to the skeletal remains. Now, the giveaway traces in uh, these skeletal remains are in the skulls, and in particular, in the teeth. Because the adult teeth, and that goes for every single one of us in this room, as well as the ancient Romans, the adult teeth still contain the chemical traces of the environment where the person was living when those teeth were forming in their jaw. So it's slightly scary. Uh, uh, the analysis and the ways of analysis are, are not yet hugely precise, but you can now clearly tell, for example, that the person, uh, the dead person, must have grown up 
in, for example, a much warmer climate or a much colder climate from the one in which they died. Now, you can't tell which warmer climate it was, whether it was just the warmer south of England, the warmer south of France, or the still warmer north of Africa, but it's showing you that people did not die where they were born. And that's beginning to be able to tell us that even in the backwater of Roman Britain, and Britain was a decided backwater in the Roman Empire, uh, that even in Roman Britain, up to about 20% of people who died in the towns of that province had grown up somewhere climatically significantly different, which is an extraordinary high level of mobility for a pre-industrial community. So it's another example of you know, what science can begin to push us towards. But actually, my favourite example is this. It is, in fact, a large sewer. Or more correctly, it is a cesspit from ancient Herculaneum, the neighbouring town to Pompeii, which was destroyed in 79 AD. It's a cesspit that is underneath a medium-sized block of Roman apartments. And what it contains, sort of down here, though you can't really see it, what it contains is literally everything that fell down from all the lavatories above, right? Absolutely unmediated. The stuff from the lavatories above came down to this cesspit and eventually decomposed. In other words, what you've got here is the remains of what went into the mouth and through the digestive tracts of the perfectly ordinary people living above. It has happily, or not, I don't say it isn't, when you go and see it, it isn't quite as disgusting as I'm making it seem, you know, I'm afraid excrement 2,000 years old it just looks like rather nice kind of fertiliser and soil or something. Um, it has been rediscovered and bags and bags and bags of it are currently being analysed in Oxford and they are giving away enormous amounts of information about what these ordinary people in the apartments above were eating quite separately from all those fantasies of elaborate cookery and exotic delicacies that we read of in Roman literature. You know, the kind of stuff, you know, oh, pass me the dormouse stuffed with anchovy in honey, please, Marcus. That's really what I fancy tonight, right? You know, the stuff of the movies. What we can see here is, even if that might have been true of some people, and it may well have been. The answer for most ordinary people is that they were eating loads of fruit, of figs, of pomegranates, of eggs, of pork, chicken and fish. And it's also obvious, partly because Herculaneum is by the coast, it's also obvious that sea urchins were a particular favourite because within this decomposed excrement, there are all kinds of tiny little spikes from the sea urchins that you recover in the mixture, which is, makes you wonder quite how painful it all <laughs> was if that was really what came out. This is quite nasty. Um, so these are just some of the new things or the new ways of getting fuller information that we've been able to exploit really in the last 20 years at most. And I'm going to be coming back to another new discovery at the end of this talk. But at this point, I want to pause a bit and say that new discoveries aren't actually the main reason that you need a new history of Rome. They're part of it, and they're an important part of it, but they're not really what drives the need to retell Roman history. So I think it goes without saying that history isn't simply about uncovering the past, seeing what's there, 
taking a look and moving on. History at its best is about some kind of conversation that you have with the past and the different questions that succeeding generations want to raise with the Roman past or with any past give all kinds of different answers and make an entirely different dialogue that we can have with Rome. And they generate a new history that works and speaks for us. History, in other words, is always a work in progress. We're always having to redo it. We can't ever make it definitive. It's not that we are better historians than our predecessors. We just have different interests and priorities. And Roman history is a very obvious example of that. Um, one thing that nobody could miss, and it's something which has changed absolutely dramatically in my lifetime, is how issues of Roman women, sexuality and gender have been treated. I mean, to be honest, when I was a student, and it's 50 years ago now, 50, 45 years ago, <laughs> um, women didn't really have much of a role in the grand sweep of the Roman historical narrative that we learned. That was largely about the policies, the aspirations, the deeds and the misdeeds and the writing of rich men. The only exception, I suppose, was in the family of the Roman emperor himself, where women sometimes were assumed to be the power and usually the villainous power behind the throne. And none was more villainous than this lady here, who is Olivia, the wife of the first Roman emperor, Augustus, who, as a jealous mother, is supposed to have got rid of everybody who stood in the way of her own son, Tiberius, rising to the throne. In the end, the story goes, she even killed her husband, the emperor, by, according to some writers, uh, Roman writers, an extremely clever trick. Augustus, as emperor, was always uh, very carefully on his guard against poisoning and had all the food at his table very carefully tasted by um, rather vulnerable servants before he himself would touch it. So what did Livia do? She painted poison on the figs as they grew on the trees in the palace gardens, it was said, because no one would ever bother to test fruit that was picked directly from the tree. And um, it did make, this did make a marvellous moment in um, the 1970s TV series of I, Claudius, where Sean Phillips, who you see here as Livia, um, once she's finally disposed of the old emperor Augustus uh, and has her son with her, is about to leave to do, no doubt, some more scheming, says to Tiberius in that wonderfully camp way, uh, oh, by the way, don't touch the figs. <laughs> It's one of my favourite moments in the I, Claudius television series. Uh, uh, and it's partly the result of, uh, of, really, of modern feminism of the last 40 years that most historians now, I have to say there are some exceptions, and not all, but most historians now don't take those stories quite so straight, quite so uncritically, even if they do go back to Roman writers themselves. I think we're now much more aware of the way that in highly patriarchal societies such as Rome, male fantasies often project crime and wicked scheming onto women who happen to be close to the centre of power. Women and transgressive female ambition is often used as an explanatory device for the accidents of history. And it's not, I have to say, entirely gone away. There was a touch of the Livia about the way that the British press used to treat Cherie Blair, who was always seen as the Machiavellian schemer behind Tony. 
So when I'm writing now, I'm obviously telling a very different story about Roman women and about Roman power with those kind of issues in mind. And I have to warn you that there are rather fewer female poisoners in my book than there were in the works of my predecessors. I should also add, I suppose, at this point, that my title, SPQR, the Senate and People of Rome, is an attempt to rescue another abused or ignored group in Roman history. I'm trying to parade the people alongside the Senate and to remind all of us, and that includes myself, that Roman history isn't just about the elite. But the big example with which I start the book is one with a very specific modern resonance and is particularly interestingly inflected in modern political debate. It's a famous moment in 63 BC and centre stage is Marcus Tullius Cicero here, one of the best known Romans of them all. Literally volumes and volumes of his letters, his speeches, his philosophical essays, and even his jokes still survive. Uh, not to mention the fact that he's become um, a slightly unlikely hero of a recent series of historical novels by Robert Harris, which he's the starring role. In 63 BC, Cicero was consul. He was the annual chief elected official in Rome, and he believed that he had uncovered a terrorist plot to overthrow the government and burn the city down. And this plot had been led by a disgruntled aristocrat over here, um, Lucius Sergius Catalina, or usually just Catiline to us. What you see on the screen is actually a 19th century painting of one of the key moments in the clash between the noble upstanding consul and the uh, uh, would-be terrorist here. And it's appropriately enough a painting um, set in the old Senate House, but commissioned to decorate the modern Italian Parliament building in the late 19th century. And it shows Cicero in full flow. Um, while Catiline is uh, deeply moody, not only deeply moody, it's absolutely clear that no one wants to sit by him. Um, <laughs> it's like they're all sitting over here and Catiline is being sent to Coventry, as we'd say. Uh, it's not an entirely accurate portrayal of the Roman Senate House either, um, which has turned in some extraordinary semicircular building vast columns such you certainly would not have seen in 63 BC. The speech, however, that we have to imagine Cicero here is in the middle of uttering does still survive uh, because it's been copied and studied and practiced and repeated ever since. And it's still just about on the school Latin syllabuses all over the Western world. And it's known as the first Catalinarian. It's the first speech that Cicero made denouncing this would-be aristocratic terrorist. And here you have the first words of that speech, um, because it starts with one of the most famous Latin quotes of them all, Quo usque tandem ebutere Catalina patientia nostra. How long will you go on, Catiline, abusing our patience? It was a fam fam famous moment in Roman history uh, and the most stunning oratorical success that Cicero ever had. And the upshot of the speech was that poor old Catiline fled the city. Whether he was quite as guilty as charged, I think we shall never know. Um, but he certainly left Rome and joined a makeshift army and was later killed in battle against official forces, which suggests he probably wasn't quite as innocent as one might sometimes have suspected. While in Rome itself, 
having got rid of the terrorist leader, Cicero rounded up the rest of the men he believed to be in the plot, and he executed them without trial, claiming the justification and the protection of an early form of a Homeland Security Act. He came to meet the public after he had overseen the execution and uttered in Latin just one rather chilling word, vixere, which means they have lived, or in other words, they're dead. Now, to start with, Cicero was heroised as a saviour of the state. But soon, doubts began to arise about the legality of his actions, because one of the fundamental principles of Roman citizenship was that the citizen, unlike the non-citizen, was entitled to a fair and free trial and could not be arbitrarily punished by any state official, no matter what crime they were suspected of. And Cicero soon found himself in exile on the charge of having executed a citizen without due process. And after he'd left town, his house was demolished and a shrine of the goddess Liberty was erected on its site. He was allowed to return a few months later, but his career never really recovered. Now, this dilemma of Cicero versus Catiline was debated ever after in Rome. And for us, I think it doesn't make much, doesn't take much to see the echoes or even the prequel here of our own debates on almost exactly the same unanswerable question. How do you balance the security of the state against the rights of the individual citizen? Cicero versus Catiline is always in my mind, at least, when we debate detention without trial, Guantanamo Bay, or more recently, the killing by British forces of British citizens fighting for ISIS. And if you want a nice glimpse of the topicality of the incident, just take a look at these rather um, eager Hungarian protesters of a couple of years ago. Um, they're protesting against their own government, but the slogan that they are blazoning is Cicero's words at the beginning of his speech against Catiline, quo usque tandem. Now, of course, the rights of Roman citizenship are not new as part of political debate. It's just they are always continually being made new and re-inflected. Go back 50 years to the middle of the Cold War and John F. Kennedy exploited the ideals of Roman citizenship for slightly different reasons in his Ich bin ein Berliner speech. 2,000 years ago, he insisted, and these are his words, the proudest boast was Civis Romanus Sum, I am a Roman citizen. Today, in the world of freedom, the proudest boast is Ich bin ein Berliner. There is, I have to say, a little sting in the tail of that one. What Kennedy or his speechwriters probably didn't realise was that the most famous and most quotable use of that phrase in ancient Rome had been a decidedly awkward one because those were the words Kiwis Romanus Sum repeatedly cried out from the cross on which he was being crucified by an unfortunate and entirely innocent citizen on the island of Sicily who was being put to death by a, Rome, by a rogue Roman governor. Even if guilty, Roman citizens were by law immune from such degrading punishment. The man was desperately trying to claim his citizen rights, Civis Romanus Sum, Civis Romanus Sum, but it turned out to make not a blind bit of difference, and he died in agony. I suspect that Kennedy speechwriters didn't know what the upshot was of that most famous use of the phrase. 
Overall, I suppose I claim that the principles and practice of Roman citizenship have underpinned in changing and very definitely changing ways Western political debate over the last 300 to 400 years, much more fundamentally actually than the principles and practice of Athenian democracy ever have. And of course, they're coming back for us into modern view in yet another different way as we debate the current crises over migration and refugees, especially but not only in Europe. I think it's worth remembering that the term illegal migrant is one that the Romans would never have understood. And in fact, in their own mythology, they believed that their earliest citizens had actually been, in our terms, a band of refugees, economic migrants and asylum seekers. So as our current investment in some of these things that the Romans debate change, so does our investment in Roman history, and so does the way we choose to write that history. But I want to spend the end of this talk going back to some of those new discoveries and sharing with you just one rediscovery of my own, and one I have to say that I made after SPQR had gone to press. Um, it's a nice indication, I think, of how new things about Rome do turn up all the time and sometimes in very unexpected places. Okay, just to set this in context. One of the questions that I address in the book is the tricky question of when Rome became Rome as we know it. That's to say the place starts off in the 9th or 8th centuries BC as a small, very ordinary little place, a bit of a dump actually, uh, on the banks of the Tiber. When does it become the Rome we know, with the institutions, the ways of doing things, and the expansionist tendencies when, that we know as Roman? When, if you like, does Rome become SPQR? Now, I'm not going to give away all the answers to that, but it won't spoil the read, I think, if I say that I'm pretty clear that the really key formative or transformative period doesn't come until the fourth century BC, probably four centuries into the city's history. And alongside that, I'm pretty clear that the first Romans that we can now encounter who are more historical than they are mythical, and certainly the first that we have any direct primary evidence for, lived around the turn of the fourth and third centuries BC. That's, what, 250, 300 years before Julius Caesar. And the first one of all who actually becomes quite a hero in my fourth chapter is a man from one of the most prominent Roman families of all, a man called Scipio Barbatus, Scipio Longbeard or Scipio Beardy. And he was consul, the leading elected official of the state in 298 BC, when Rome had already gained control of a lot of the Italian peninsula and was on the cusp of expanding overseas. His descendants, men like Scipio Africanus and Scipio Aemilianus, want to be, went on to be some of the most um, successful or bloodstained, I suppose, depending on your point of view, of Roman conquerors of them all. It was Africanus and Aemilianus who, between them, sent Hannibal and the Carthaginians packing. Now, almost all the traces we can find of Barbatus, as I shall now call him, look very archaic, and they would have looked that way to later Romans too. But at the time, Barbatus was a hugely innovative representative of this new Rome that's now Rome. Among other things, he was the first to build himself a big family tomb on the first big road that was ever built out of the city going south, the Appian 
way. This is Piranesi's imaginative version of it from the late 18th century. And I can't see how it could ever possibly have looked like that. Um, you can, in fact, still visit this tomb. This is what it looks like in the inside. Very definitely rather spooky mausoleum. And this is its slightly down at heel exterior, which doesn't look very much. And this is the sarcophagus of Scipio Barbatus himself. And it's inscribed on the outside with what is effectively the first mini biography of any Roman ever to survive. And it's extraordinarily revealing of the ideology of this period. We don't know exactly when Barbatus died, but a good guess is to say the 280s BC. 250 years before the death of Caesar. And here uh, are the words uh, themselves, which I think speak very plainly about the ideology of the period. You've got the Latin up there, but here um, you've got uh, my English translation. Here's his name, Cornelius Lucius Scipio Barbatus, born of his father Gnaeus. And here is what counts. He was a brave man and a wise one. Interesting, his appearance was equal to his virtue, looking good counted, I think, in Rome. And then in his offices, he was consul, he was censor, and another office edile amongst you. And then the military ideology. He captured Tarasia, Kizauna, and Samnium. He subdued all Lucania, and he took hostages. Now, in a way, um, that sums him up. Uh, and you can see what I mean, I think, by saying that by this point, the Romans had become Roman. But there's another story to Scipio Barbatus, um, which I've been tracking down in the last few months, and which leads very directly right back to the man himself. Although it starts a slightly different track. And that is the story of the tombs uncovering in the late 18th century, in 1780 to be precise. Now the excavation at that period was something of a cause celebre because it was sponsored by Pope Pius VI, who took all the stuff worth having back to the Vatican, raising a lot of questions about how come the church was disturbing this last resting place of the ancient dead. So actually, um, when you visit the tomb now, what you see are exact copies of what was found in the tomb, including Barbatus's favorite famous sarcophagus, the originals all being in the Vatican, where you can still see them. Now, it was partly those arguments surrounding it that gave the tomb huge fame in the 19th century. It was a con controversial site, and it made it one of the hot spots for tourists in the city of Rome in a way that it certainly isn't now. And replicas of Barbatus's coffin actually crop up in the most unlikely places. Here is a... Uh, version of Barbatus's coffin. You can see it's exactly the same um, in Highgate Cemetery in London, um, containing the last remains of a female novelist. And here is one in Philadelphia, uh, containing the last remains of Commodore Isaac Hull. And if you were to go to the Protestant cemetery in Rome itself, you'd actually come across a line of about nine of these coffins. And just supposing you didn't actually fancy being buried in one, you could always turn it into what every 19th century desk needed, which was a Scipio Barbatus inkwell, right? You take the little top off, and you've got the hole for the ink underneath. So it becomes very, very big in the 19th century and very controversial. And it doesn't take much to see that there's another little question lurking here. 
which is, if the Pope took that coffin that was so often replicated and took it off to the Vatican, what actually happened to Barbatus's bones? People were worried at the time about disturbing the dead, but where had the dead gone? Now, it seems after the tomb was excavated that the bones themselves ended up in an elaborate villa garden in Padua after they'd been given by the Pope to a well-known Venetian senator, Senator Querini, who incorporated them into his lavish philosophical garden at his villa at Altichiero. Now, this is a drawing of the memorial that apparently held the bones of Scipio Barbatus, this thing. Um, to say, I don't entirely see what the phallic symbols <laughs> or doing quite next door, but never mind. Uh, we won't ever know, I suspect, because although this drawing survives, the whole garden itself has been destroyed, and I haven't yet been able to discover what happened to the very bones of Scipio Barbatus. There was, however, something else. It is said that on the finger of the bones of Barbatus had been a signet ring. And this didn't go to Padua with the bones, but it went to the Pope himself, who generously gave it to a French scholar, Monsieur Duton, who had actually studied the Scipio family, and the Pope thought it'd be nice for him to have the ring. Monsieur Duton later sold it or gave it to the English Lord Barclay. And in the late 19th century, through a combination of sale and inheritance, Barbatus's ring was said to have ended up in the collection of the Dukes of Northumberland at Annick Castle in the north of England, um, where, in fact, Harry Potter movies and parts of Downton Abbey are now filmed. And after that, it doesn't get mentioned. When a few weeks ago... I emailed the Duke's administration at Annick. I didn't really imagine that the ring would still be there. But after a certain kind of polite ducal delay, I got an email back to say that indeed Scipio Barbatus's ring was still in the possession of the Duke at Annick. And here it is. It is the very ring that Barbatus took with him to his tomb. It's quite plain, it's plain gold, uh, but appropriately enough for one of these early Romans with military ambition, the, uh, the design of the signet ring itself is a figure of the goddess Victory. Now for me, I'm going to confess, there was a bit more of a special thrill here. This must count, I think, as the only bit of Roman jewellery that we can match up with a known historical owner. It's the only ring we've got with a name attached, and that's this great man of the early 3rd century BC. And where does it turn up? It turns up in a British medieval castle. And I have to say, if I wasn't actually currently in the United States, I'd be hot-footing it up to Annick and hoping that they'd let me try this ring on, which I have to say <laughs> is my ambition. But one thing is for sure, if my SPQR is lucky to get a second edition, this ring is certainly going to have pride of place in it. But you saw it first, so thank you. Uh, right, I think I'm now uh, uh, allowed or supposed to um, take some of these really interesting questions um, that uh, people have submitted in 
uh, on pieces of paper. And I, I hope that Jennifer is going to tell us when we've reached the end of time, partly because I can't see a thing in the dark um, and uh, um, have very little grip on exactly how late we are. But I will take them pretty much at, in, in random order and I'll read them out uh, and I'll answer them as, as uh, briefly as I can. The first one is very much um, to my taste, um, which says, why didn't Alia Potestas appear in SPQR? Uh, that's a very nice question because it's referring to one of the most um, extraordinary tombstones uh, ever to appear of a Roman woman, ever to be found of a Roman woman. Um, and it's currently in a museum at Rome and it's a very detailed, long tombstone describing the virtues of this woman called Alia Potestas, but also describing her living arrangements. Uh, and her living arrangement is that she is the centre of a ménage à trois, uh, living with two young men, which breaks up after Alia Potestas died, but it describes her virtues while she was still living there, describes her body in almost uncomfortable detail. Um, uh, there are very elaborate discussions of her breasts and nipples on the tombstone. Um, uh, but it also says quite sort of um, underminingly um, that in this menage a trois, Alia Potestas was always the first up uh, in the morning and the last to go to bed at night because, of course, she was still doing the housework, however erotic she was. And I have to say, it's very, it's a very remiss of me not to put Alia Potestas in the book. It is probably, she probably dates from slightly after uh, the time scale of my book, which ends in 212 AD, um, when Caracalla uh, the Emperor Caracalla gives all Roman citizen, all Roman inhabitants of the empire citizenship. Um, but I think it's a bit sad that, uh, that I did leave her out um, because um, whoever asked this question knows as well as I do that uh, she is one of the very few glimpses that we get of a woman uh, on a tombstone or in any form in Rome who doesn't simply accord to some sort of male fantasy of the absolutely perfect married woman. Um, then I've got uh, a, a, another question here which has given me uh, three um, opportunities um, to, to choose uh, different questions, but I'm going to choose number two. Um, it's as if you could have dinner and drinks with one man and one woman from the Roman world, who would they be and why? Um, I'm afraid I'm going to choose Cicero as my man, um, because although Cicero has had you know, a kind of bad press, I mean, deeply, deeply conservative and terribly pompous. When I was doing my book on Roman laughter, I, I discovered just what Cicero's other ancient reputation was, um, which was um, to be the best joker the Roman world had ever seen. In fact, Cicero's problem, says one of his biographers, is he just didn't know when to stop telling those gags and it was so irritating. So I'm going to sit next at dinner to the world's, Roman world's greatest joker and, you know, I'm torn for my woman. I mean, if I'm going to have dinner with somebody, you know, I'd like, you know, if possible, to hear uh, from somebody we don't know about. So, you know, in a, in a rather PC way, I'd say I want to hear kind of you know, the views of the, the slave female masseurs at the local baths. Um, but I'd probably actually choose Nero's mum, Agrippina. <laughs> Especially to find out if Nero really had murdered her. Um, if you could conjure up one piece of new technology, what mystery about ancient Rome would you want to solve? That's a very difficult one. Um, because I think... <laughs> There's kind of the, the way of understanding ancient, what, you know, what stands between us and really getting to grips and getting close with the Roman world probably isn't any one thing. It's a kind of whole set of things 
that we can't quite understand. And I'm not sure that I could actually imagine, a bit, apart from time travel, a bit of new technology that would uh, really um, answer some of the things that, that have always puzzled me. But uh, if, uh, this isn't a bit of a cop-out. I think I would say that I would just love to know what really happened in a Roman public bath. But if there was any way of finding that out, um, uh, I would, um, I'd go there. Um, how would the Roman government secure funds to support its governmental operations, legions and bread and circuses? And that's, you know, where does the money come from in Rome is a huge question. And, uh, I mean, one problem is that the people who've tried to work out you know, some big mega economic calculations about how the Roman Empire sustained itself, you know, I have reckoned that actually, despite the the, the sense that it has you know more money than that it needs and can burn it in vast extravagant building projects, probably it was often. Um, managing on a bit of a knife edge of economic stability. Uh, there's one very key example of that, um, which we learn about at the end of the reign of the first Emperor Augustus, when there's a mutiny. And the mutiny is caused by the fact that the Roman soldiers are being kept on for longer than their official number of years of service in the Roman army, and that their pensions are being decreased. Now, I think I certainly know from um, debates currently in the UK, and maybe they're the same here, that, uh, that any government that is making you work longer and paying you less pension um, is actually got trouble with the balance of payments. And there are many hints that Rome was, for all the way it could call on uh, the natural resources, including the silver mines of Spain, um, uh, uh, to, in a sense, to underpin its operations, it is nevertheless marginal sometimes in its ability to keep going. And so you say, how did they secure the funds? Taxation the exploitation of the natural resources of the world, taxation in various forms, including port taxes, import taxes, um, and they only just managed it, I think. Um, here's a question about uh, many stories in the Talmud are parables or symbolic, but one portion of the Talmud recounts that Nero converted to Judaism. If that, historian, if that story is historically factual, could it account for the negative depiction of the Emperor Nero by Roman historians, such as Tacitus, who also described Jews in a very ugly way? That's certainly the case that Tacitus did, and many other writers did describe Jews uh, in an extremely ugly way, not quite as ugly as they describe the Christians, but pretty bad. Um, one thing we do know, um, I think it's very, very unlikely, I have to say, that, that uh, Nero himself um, actually um, converted um, to Judaism. But it is clear that some senior Romans did convert to Judaism or were attracted by Judaism. And um, it, is, it is one, I think, from, from the point of view of uh, a Roman historian thinking of from the baseline of paganism in the Roman world, it's actually extremely interesting how far other forms, particularly of monotheism, did become attractive to uh, many people at Rome and not just the elite. Um, what what we know is that um, that I suppose you 
and it becomes very difficult to understand. You see periods, both in Judaism and Christianity, of big standoffs between exclusive monotheism and Roman polytheistic pa paganism. And you see also periods of um, much greater um, laissez-faire from the Roman authorities, and particularly in relation to Judaism, not the case for Christianity until the third century at least, um, you see that there are some major Jewish figures uh, in the background of Roman history um, who are really, in some senses, power brokers. And after the end of the first Julio-Claudian dynasty, um, the man who put Vespasian the first leader of the next successful dynasty on the throne, um, was an extremely prominent and powerful Jew called Tiberius Julius Alexander. So there's a, there is a very big and unresolved issue here about uh, the relationship between uh, Roman paganism, which we tend to think of as far too monolithic, I think, and uh, Judaism and Christianity, uh, and how that actually works out in not only um, the ordinary everyday lives of Rome, but really the power structure. Um, I can't, I'm afraid, read that one. <laughs> so I'm terribly sorry. So if I've missed you out, I had to come and ask. I just couldn't read it. Um, but then the last one would be Caesar populist his hero, we're talking Julius Caesar here, populist hero or dangerous dictator. <sighs> and I think my answer to that has to be both, you know? Um, you know Caesar is an extraordinarily interesting character. Uh, uh, we ought to be able to know exactly or much more clearly what was driving him than most uh, Roman major political figures, because we have his own account of um, some of his campaigns, both against the Gauls, where he was, you know, effectively, I'm afraid, a genocidal maniac, um, and also in the Civil War. Um, but even so, it becomes extremely uncertain what actually Caesar's ambition is. And of course, the problem is he gets killed too soon. You know, you know, we can't quite see where it's all going because he gets nipped in the bud. I suppose the one thing that I would say is that although I was brought up to think of the assassins of Caesar as yet another group of Romans who were standing up, as Shakespeare's Julius Caesar would have it, um, for liberty against dictatorship in the ancient world, uh, the more I've looked at the careers of people like Brutus and Cassius, these supposedly noble Romans, the more I thought they were kind of repulsive load of characters. And Brutus, at one, at one stage, is, I think, charging something like 98% interest to some poor, uh, unsuspecting um, citizens of Cyprus who've taken out a loan from him. And when he finds it difficult to get the money paid, he manages to go and um, well, basically besiege the local council chamber in one of the main towns of Cyprus and actually starve some of the councillors to death. Now, um, that's the guy who uh, later on becomes um, paraded as a hero of the people's liberty. Um, and I think it just shows uh, what a complicated old world uh, the history of ancient Rome is, if that is the case. So thank you very much, everybody.